Okay, so hold up. All right, so just a takeaway from that video that I want you guys to notice was that um, people in Africa were trading natural resources, right? So they were trading gold, which requires mining. They were trading timber, which requires uh, cutting down forests. And they were trading ivory, which requires ivory and animal skins, which requires um, killing the animals, right? So you do have that happening. Now, let me see. Let me turn this up. Okay. And we'll share. All right. So now the next video that I'm going to be talking about or um, the next video I'm going to be showing is going to be one uh, that's talking about the Indian Ocean Trade Network. And that's um, important to learn about because the Ottoman Empire uh, in the 14th to early 20th century was blocking Western Europe from this Indian Ocean Trade Network. And the Indian Ocean Trade was full of things like spices, gold, silver, um, mostly spices, they really wanted spices, things like pepper, things like nutmeg, things like cinnamon. And of course, all of this requires land cut, cleared, right? So spices like pepper, cinnamon, nutmeg, etc. they're all grown. So you need agricultural plantations basically for this kind of crop. But the problem that was happening was that this Ottoman Empire, they were necessarily blocking Western Europe from in uh, sort of trading with the Indian Ocean Network, they were being the middleman. So to get any pepper, you would have to go through the Ottoman Empire, you would have to go through these uh, Ottoman merchants who would basically mark up the price and it would be much more expensive for you to purchase whatever you wanted from this Indian Ocean Trade Network. Where So this is what happened uh, in the, in the early early 1500s, uh, some countries in Western Europe decided that they wanted to um, see if they could find a way around Africa to this Indian Ocean network so that they wouldn't have to pay as much to get what they wanted. And that's where you get into this uh, Portugal uh, sending Vasco da Gama out to the Indies and then Columbus in Spain, uh, Columbus trying to find the Indies as well. But, so we're gonna look at this video now. Okay, so the main takeaway I want you guys to take from that video is that, yes, what he mentioned on the last part was this idea of the merchants being the ones that sort of tell the people with the funny hats, the royals, the heads of state, where to go, that becomes a huge thing later on. Um, so we will, how much time do I have? Move into this again. All right. All right, so what I want you guys to take from that video was the idea that all of this exploration, all of this um, Europeans going out of these boundaries is due to this idea of going out and finding wealth. So, let me see. Just this last bit, we are going to... Yeah, so... Columbus and Vasco da Gama were out there looking for sugar, spices, and gold and silver. And we already went into that. So once Spain and Portugal start making a lot of money through uh, extorting the Indian Ocean trade and um, also running into the Aztec and Incan empires and finding a mountain of silver in Peru, uh, Britain and the Netherlands and all the other European countries kind of wanted to get in on it. But what happened was that uh, 
we get into this uh we get into this uh this age of where companies are actually sort of the ones that are doing the moving and the shaking merchant companies so the east indian companies of britain and the dutch east india company uh they came they were founded in the early 1600s they were given the power to wage war in search of all these uh this revenue this ability to trade and their main objective was to go out there, find countries that had resources and basically take over these resources to control the means of production. Um, so I don't know if you guys know anything about uh, the alien universe, xenomorphs, alien versus predator, et cetera. But when I was writing this lecture, I was thinking of Whaling Utani, which is the corporation, the evil corporation basically. Um, Yes. Okay, cool. At least one, <laughs> um, uh, which uh, pretty much goes out, colonizes uh, planets, mines them for minerals or whatever, also builds processing plants, and they send people out there to do their work. And they're all about just making sure that planets sort of uh, bring profit in. And they have colonial marines, so they have militaries out there that are able to help them do their work. Um, this is basic, it's basically Whaling Utani, but in the 1600s. So again, war without trade, they cannot carry on trade without war, nor war without trade. They needed these colonies, these regions to be forced to trade with them, the, the actual raw materials that they needed to bring back to their countries um, to sort of help with industrialization. And so this is the final video. Oh, that's nice. MailChimp's marketing smarts. You get a whole lot of creative smarts. Recommendation smarts. The Scramble for Africa and the Berlin Conference. What was the Scramble for Africa? In the 1800s, European countries were rushing into Africa to plant their flags in the land and claim colonies. Because of industrialization, Europe wanted Africa's valuable resources. Some of these included palm oil, cotton, gold, diamonds, and... That is just a sneak peek of what we're going to be talking about on Thursday. The main idea is that colonialism basically occurred because um, European countries wanted more resources. They wanted to control the resources that were needed for them to industrialize. And they also wanted to have people that were required to buy the products. It was all about money, basically. So yeah, they, did ne they never got Ethiopia. Uh, Ethiopia actually sort of played them against each other and ended up getting um, European guns and then fought off the Italians. I think it was like in 1847 or something like that. So Ethiopia was never colonized, neither was Liberia, which is the, um, the little country that uh, freed African Americans went to. Uh, I think prior to the Civil War, um, they were sent there, uh, I guess, by abolitionists or something like that to sort of create a free country for African Americans or former enslaved people. Were the uncolonized parts of Africa, were there? Yeah, so just Caleb, just Ethiopia and um, Liberia. But um, this, this whole company sort of company col colonialism occurred across uh, the world. And so we'll also talk about that on Thursday. So does anyone have any questions?
yeah yeah so they did um native africans did practice land management similar to native americans they used fire for the most part as well to um, create pasture lands for their cattle Okay, so no one else has any more questions. All right, so when I mentioned Tuesday about the East India companies and how they're sort of like Weyland Yutani, where they are basically their own nation, but their focus is on making profit. Um, that's really what colonized India and um, Southeast Asia. So you have these European companies, actually, countries too, but companies most of the part, most, most of the way, um, installing these proxy Indian rulers because they wanted to expand their market for both these raw natural resources that they needed, and then also to provide a market for the items that they made back in Europe. Uh, by mid-1800, the British East India Company dominated most of India. It was the dominant power. The Dutch East India Company had a foothold earlier on, but they were sort of kicked out by the British um, company. France was also in there, but they didn't have their own company. And I think... Now, I think those are the top three that were in there. Southeast Asia, we had both British, Netherlands, so the Dutch, France, and Portugal, and also Spain. But they were mostly there for missionary um, work. So they went in there and Christian um, converted locals. Uh, I can't remember anything about them actually focusing on natural resources in Southeast Asia. They were mostly in South America by this time and bits of North America and Central America. So, uh, and what ended up happening was that indigenous people were conscripted into forced labor on these cash crop plantations to meet both the company's profit goals and both also the colonial government's profit goals. So, so the kind of crops that were popular in South and Southeast Asia were the spices. So you have pepper, cinnamon, and cloves and mace. You have indigo. So this plant that you used to create the dye indigo, that was a big thing. Um, cotton was started to get huge in the 1800s. Opium as well, because they used it to trade with, um, well, they used it to get a foothold in China. Uh, so China didn't really, China didn't see a point to trading with European, uh, European powers because they couldn't make everything that they really wanted in China. So they started asking for gold and silver to sort of make up that deficit. Uh, the fact that the European powers weren't really giving them anything that they wanted and that's kind of what pushed Portugal and Spain to go look for gold and silver in West Africa and then also in South America. But uh, the British ended up, ended up uh, using opium to sort of create this addiction in a lot of the coastal cities that caused a huge problem and sort of gave them a foothold in China. Tea, uh, since we were, they were obviously having problems with China, uh, they started, uh, trading plantations for tea. You have teak, which was a huge thing, is this wood. Uh, so these are some pictures of teak um, logs that were cut down in the forest. And here is a teak plantation. Uh, the Dutch actually sort of started this, actually, I don't know if it was the Dutch. I think it, it might have been Germany. It was either Germany or um, the Dutch that started the whole idea of forestry and forest plantations because they had spent most of the 
most of the decades, like cutting down these select pieces of timber, I mean, teak in the natural forests. And then they realized that they were running out of teak in these natural forests. So they decided to clear off the forest and create these teak plantations. They were hoping to actually use it as a cash crop um, and grow it in a way that they could use it for shipbuilding. But then there was like some rumors that uh, plantation teak wasn't as good as natural teak. So it was kind of off and on during the 1800s. And uh, I should have put this up with spices, but nutmeg, I just really wanted to focus on that real quick because um, that was like the cause of a genocide on one of these local islands, uh, the Bandanese genocide. So back in the 1600s, the Dutch wanted, the Dutch company, East Dutch East India Company, wanted to get a foothold in India and in Southeast Asia. And they were focusing on islands to sort of make these trading outposts. They found uh, that the Banda Islands where supposedly it was the only source of nutmeg, which was this really rare and sought after spice. So they were like, oh yeah, we want to get in on that. But the Bandanese, they were willing to trade with them However, they were willing to trade with everyone. So the British started, the British East India Company started coming in and the Dutch didn't want that to happen. So they wanted to build a fort on the Banda Islands. The Bandanese didn't want it, that to happen. So um, some conflicts happened. I think the Bandanese killed 40 Dutch traders during a meeting and then later the Dutch came in and killed 2,800, enslaved 1,700 for their nutmeg plantations, and then expelled the rest off the islands. And this happened in 1641. So what I want you guys to focus on during this is that all of this, all of these plants that need to be um, planted and taken care of, all of this, uh, this, these natural resources that might be better as natural instead of plant plantation breed. Um, all of this requires either habitat degradation in the form of going into forests and cutting down a whole bunch of, of these natural teak plantation, uh, natural teak trees, and then dragging them out and logging down, logging down any weedy trees that you don't want and creating roadways into these forests to get to these teak groves. All of this requires habitat degradation or just habitat clearance. So people were clearing natural forests, native forests, to um, create these uh, pepper plantations and tea plantations and teak plantations and indigo plantations. So when I'm mentioning this, I want you guys to think of habitat destruction, basically. All right, so going into Spain and Portugal. Uh, Spain and Portugal, as I mentioned, mostly focused on the New World, so North and South America. Um, for Spain, as the video mentioned on Tuesday, they were focused mostly on gold, glory, and God. So they wanted to focus on conversion of locals into Christians and then riches as well. And they were really the ones that really sort of used religion as a way to get indigenous people under their, um, their power. So we have Spain um, wiping out the indigenous populations on the Caribbean islands that they first landed on, mostly due to the disease, but also due to forced labor because they were sure that they were gonna find gold on these islands and they had the indigenous people uh, mining for gold. But you also have, uh... actually I'm not sure where I'm going with that. Okay. So for cash crops in America, your focus mostly on gold and silver. 
they had they ended Spain ended up finding this mountain in Peru that was chock full of silver. So they again conscripted whatever remaining indigenous people who hadn't died of the diseases that they carried into these silver mines. Um, they all were also focused on citrus orchards and coffee and cotton and cocoa and later cane sugar. So I had that reading that I want you guys to do and that's not gonna be due next Thursday since we're not gonna be doing anything on next Thursday, I'll reschedule it. But um, the first paragraph of that reading mentions how uh, on these Caribbean islands, basically what happened was um, Spain and then France, they, and Britain as well, but uh, they basically denuded so they cut down all of the forest on these Caribbean islands to create these uh, cane sugar plantations. And cane sugar was really one of the big reasons why uh, slavery started like getting in really big in, in the new world in America <clears throat> because they needed a, a, a labor force to take care of all this cane sugar. It's a really um, labor intensive crop. Uh, but Spain didn't really, Spain and Portugal didn't really find uh, too much, like too many natural resources that they really wanted in South America. So they focused on using, well, clearing land for uh, ranches. So goats, sheep, and beef cattle. So once again, we have uh, habitat destruction, uh, native habitat destruction. Sort of this, it's, it's basically Europeans going out and and making um, making their colonies into sort of these these countrywide farms for them to harvest these resources, these cash crops that they could use to sell back at home. For North America, we have a whole bunch of power, Spain, France, Russia, in some instances, mostly in the Northwest, uh, Scotland as well. And we had our own companies, just like the British East India and the Dutch East India companies. We had the Northwest and the Hudson Bay and a whole bunch of other like fur based companies. Um, so most of the cash crops in North America were furs and timbers. So we have, um, this man with beaver furs. Beaver was a huge thing uh, in North America and it caused a huge population decline in beavers. Um, we, if you guys saw my lecture I gave maybe two years ago, I forgot, um, in David Miller's class, this is a mountain of bison skulls and uh, bison were hunted down for a variety of reasons. Uh, there was meat, uh, you could use their skins, but they're in their bones, you ground them up as fertilizer. But another part, another reason that they were killed was because uh, the Native Americans, the Great Plains Native American tribes depended on them. So if you take their food resource out, you pretty much cut them out under the knees. Uh, cotton was also another cash crop, tobacco and cane sugar was a big thing. So cotton obviously and tobacco um, was a big reason that uh, slavery occurred in the South. They needed that uh, conscripted cheap, basically uh, free labor um, to sort of take care of these labor intensive crops. So you have that idea of, you know, getting into a place um, setting things up so that you have these items that people want back in Europe or in any of the, of the other colonies that you have across the globe since they're now captive markets. And you have to make it so that you have this resource is extracted in the cheapest way possible, right? So it's all about profit basically during this period. And here is a video on the North American forests.
so vast and unlimited. Sorry, you guys. I thought I had, I have a Cooper's Hawk that occasionally comes out to those trees and I thought I was hearing it, but I think it's a blue jay, so. Okay. All right, so finally we come to uh, Africa. So as mentioned in that video we saw on Tuesday, the Berlin Conference uh, happened in 1884, and this was mostly so that European powers could actually um, divide up Africa without getting into wars with each other like they had for uh, India and Southeast Asia. And as I mentioned on Tuesday, and as Ricardo mentioned, Ethiopia did remain independent as long and along with Liberia, which is the state that was made uh, for the African-Americans that were leaving slavery and decided to go back to Africa. And I get this to move. Okay, so uh, Africa's cash crops were varied and this is just a very quick sample, but of course we have ivory, um, comes from elephants. So you obviously have to kill elephants. You have gold and diamonds, which requires mining, which also requires habitat destruction. Uh, mines in themselves, they require both habitat clearance and then you need wood to um, create shelters for the people that are mining. You need wood to uh, provide firewood for the people that are mining and you need roads so that, you know, food can get to the people that are mining. So this all requires habitat degradation and habitat clearance. You have palm oil, coffee, sisal, and rubber plantations that were occurring as well, which also requires habitat clearance. Um, and then finally you have people, which, uh, yeah. Um, it's like, it's estimated that like 15 million people were, taken out of Africa at some probably to total and uh, moved to mostly America and mostly the Americas, uh, mostly the Caribbeans and South America, but some of them ended up in North America as well. But you also have, it's not just Africa that was sort of losing its people to slavery. You also have places like Madagascar, um, and a lot of the small islands were, uh, were where local indigenous people were being captured and conscripted into labor. So we have Malagasy people um, being forced into South America, uh, South Africa to uh, work in the gold and diamond mines. And just as an example, just to sort of see all this habitat uh, the influence of colonialism for the most part on this hab on habitat. Uh, you've seen this map before in our talk on, I think Western management. So it was the fourth lecture. Uh, so we have in 1400, we have a lot of um, pasture land going on, a lot of crop, not so much crop land in Africa but you see this intensity. So in South America, we have a lot more pasture land. This is the influence of Spain and Portugal and those cattle ranches that I mentioned. Um, you also have pasture land happening in here, this intensity going up here. You have pasture land happening around here as well. And then you have um, an increase in cropland in Africa and in India and in Southeast Asia and all of these islands over here. So it was, this, it was a huge influence on native habitat. And this is where most of the, most of, most of the negative effects on wildlife occurred. So it wasn't necessarily 
killing for skins or um, transporting for transporting for um, natural history museums or for the for the exotic animal trade, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But it was the loss of habitat or habitat destruction or habitat degradation that was causing these uh, population declines for animals. So at least for the primates, I was able to find this uh, chapter in a book where we talk about uh, primate trade in the age of discovery. So this is for 1500s to 1700s. Um, over 20 species were uh, taken out of the wild and sort of imported into European countries as pets or uh, for zoos or circuses or whatnot. And um, it was a routine trade of animals. So they were, it was a routine thing. Like you just go out in the forest and you mostly be focused on wood or uh, gold and silver. But if you happen to capture this capuchin monkey in South America, you know that you could get a good price for that if it survived the shipping all the way back to Europe. <clears throat> and it's believed that uh, in some regions of Brazil, this early exploitation of the population, in addition to the habitat destruction, caused population declines, particularly for endemic species, so or species that had small geographic ranges, so were focused mostly in one area. Um, obviously, if you take out a lot of the habitat or take out a lot of the individuals from that population, and there's only so few populations in one region, it obviously causes a huge impact on that species. So just very brief takeaways, we will come back to this topic, uh, not next week, but a week after March 2nd and March 4th. But um, takeaways were that colonialism, again, mostly pushed by interest and wealth. Uh, but for Spain, obviously, it was also per uh, pushed by conversion of indigenous people into Christians. We have uh, environmental destruction and degradation, degradation happening mostly due to cash crop plantations and um, the extraction of timber or uh, mining for gold and silver and diamonds happening. And that was where most of the influence of, of colonialism occurred on a lot of these countries. And um, yes. So the last point, it, most of the natural resource destruction didn't come from necessarily extraction, but from conversion into these plantations of rubber and cocoa and coffee and sisal and tea and indigo and all this other stuff that people, um, Europeans were focused on growing in these countries so that they could sell it either in their home country or in other colonies that they had across the globe. So does anyone have any questions? That it would be good cash crops. They, uh, the local peoples were already trading with them. So most of the, most of colonialism occurred in like certain steps especially in South Asia and in India and in Southeast Asia, you had these trading relationships between European powers and uh, the local populations. And then the European powers decided that they either wanted uh, more access, better prices, or they wanted to keep competitors like the British and the Dutch or France or Portugal and Spain out of the market. So, a lot of their information came from um, their work with uh, their trading relationships, their first trading relationships with local indigenous people. That was a good question. Video says timber was scarce after the fires, harvest clearing. Were any conservation practices taken in response? So yeah, so obviously once we get into the 1900s and even like 1850, particularly in India, um, either the Dutch or the German, I'm not sure which country it is. I'm thinking it's the Dutch, it's gotta be. Um, but they were realizing that, yeah, 
timber, all these resources that we really want, it's running out. So they started practicing practicing forestry, like started practicing the first, um, kind of the first iteration of forestry, at least in the modern age, um, especially in India for teak. And then we also get into this, uh, that's sort of when conservation, the conservation movement started. So we'll be talking about that in two weeks. Um, this idea of obviously the resources are not um, inexhaustible. So we have to start either saving or figuring out a different way of using them. So sustainable use or preservation, conservation or preservation. Uh, what was the survival rate of animals that were shipped to Europe? It was pretty low. It depends obviously on the animals that you're shipping, but um, from the readings, the smattering of readings I've done, um, if you shipped like 20 animals, maybe you would end up with five if you're lucky at the end of all that. Uh, and obviously, you know, obviously it's because the husbandry, like the, the care of the animals wasn't all that great. Um, for the most part, especially with monkeys, you had animals sort of running free. So it would be easy for them to fall off the ship if, uh, if it was stormy or something like that. But you also have to think about the food, the lack of food that they had available, um, because obviously they're not going to be able to get them anything fresh because they're eating basically what the sailors are eating. Um, then you have the change in the temperature, you have the conditions. I mean, sailing wasn't easy for humans <laughs> back then. So obviously you're not going to have it being really easy for animals either, especially tropical animals going to um, cold places like England or Liverpool or whatever. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can get you more hard concrete numbers, but that's basically, you'd be lucky if you had five or one. Um, any other, are you going to discuss the Hudson Bay Company and the fur trade? Well, I was hoping one of you guys would do that with, um, I know someone picked beavers, so that would be a good topic to include in your talk, but I can. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I can. I can go over it. How long did the destruction of forests last and how long did it take? It didn't take them long to realize that they were running out of things. Um, yeah, so for, uh, okay, so yeah, David, uh, Mia is planning on looking at that. But um, so for the Dutch in India, they were, they sort of had control of most of their regions in India that they would have control over by 1700s. And by 1850, they're re realizing that they're running out of teak and other woods that they wanted to extract from the area. So, um, and realizing that they have to start thinking about new ways of using what remaining wood what there was. So uh, obviously people are smart. People even back then were smart. They could realize when they were running out of things and when they needed to just start thinking of it in a different way. What was the main use they used ivory for at that time? It was mostly ornamental. So you have things like um, statues, you have things like curio stands, you have jewelry, you have handles or pretty sure there were some tables in there as well. Yeah, but it was mostly ornamental. It wasn't like they were using it as handles for shovels or anything like that, right? <laughs> Any other questions? I'm gonna update it. 
I'll update it before noon today. Um, I'll be focused on, I'll be working on that after this, after we leave. So, um, and I'll send an announcement with everything that's updated. So the updated schedule and all the updated um, assignment dates. Everyone good? Yeah, seeing hands up or thumbs up. Okay.